Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Welcome everyone, thanks for downloading another episode of the podcast. Our guest today is Andy, who served in the British Army in the Royal Ulster Constabulary as a uniformed officer. Then after he'd passed an intensive selection course, he transferred to E4A, the police unit tasked with covert surveillance operations during the Troubles. It's worth pointing out before we get into it that everything we discuss in this podcast is open source and can be found by MD out there on the internet or in books. Uh, but it's worth remembering all three branches of the forces deployed to Northern Ireland under the name Operation Banner from 1969 to 2007, and it was the longest continuous deployment in British military history. The army was there at the request of the Unionist government of Northern Ireland in response to the August riots of 1969. And the army's role was to restore order, and they took control from 1969 until the mid 70s, when the RUC assumed primacy to set up the authority of the British government in Northern Ireland. The counterinsurgency involved the army supporting the police in carrying out their duties, but also guarding key points, mounting checkpoints and patrols, carrying out raids and searches, riot control, and bomb disposal. More than 300,000 soldiers served Northern Ireland, and at the peak of the operation in the 70s, about 21,000 British troops were deployed. The RUC paid a heavy price, with over 300 officers killed both on and off duty. Four were killed in friendly fire incidents. In addition, in 1999, it was reported that 70 had taken their own lives. Many of the 9,000 officers who were injured on duty live with a legacy of handicap and suffering. But this duty was recognised in 1999 when the force was awarded the George Cross to honour the courage and dedication of police officers and their families. This is the highest honour conferred on civilians taking precedence over all medals except the Victoria Cross. Individual members of the RUC have been awarded 16 George Medals, 100 Queen's Gallantry Medals, 150 Queen's Commendations for Brave Conduct, 120 Queen's Police Medals and 150 British Empire Medals. In episode 7 with Neil Hogg, we discuss what it's like to be a soldier and not banner. On this episode, we're going to discuss Andy's time in the army and what it was like to police the troubles. So Andy, thank you for coming on the podcast. So can you start by telling us when you joined the army, why you joined the army, and an overview of your career before joining the RUC? Thanks, guys. Uh, Nice to be with you. So I was uh, leaving school, 1982, um, very few jobs around. Initially looked at the Navy and then decided on joining the Army. I liked being outdoors. Didn't fancy an apprenticeship or staying on at school. Liked to be involved in sport. So off I went to the Army. Pretty much like I think most of the guys that I served with, uh, my scores were high in the test. You can do any job you like in the Army. However, all we've got available is junior infantry, junior artillery. Um, So it was artillery for me. Junior leaders, initially meant to be posted to 2-2 Lark, locating Lark Hill, a last-minute admin error, and I got shipped off to Germany to Fiverr Edge, uh, which worked out quite well. Otherwise, I'd never have heard of Special OP Troop. And again, like most of the people that I served with in the troop back in the day, I got knocked back by my uh, BSM. So it took a year to get actually on a selection. Luckily, got through the initial selection, and then on to the course where very much as a very young gunner at the time, I think I was barely 20, scraped through by the, the skin of my teeth. Um, I think on the tactics side and, and the patrolling and the map reading, I, I was pretty much there. But not being the, the tallest or the biggest, I did struggle on the load carrying and on the fitness side when it was you know the, the long tabs and yomps. And I, and I did find that very difficult in the time, sort of questioned whether I, I was actually up to it. But I was really guided through it by Stevie Commons, um, who I'd met briefly um, working with an 18 battery on a site guard. Passed through that, posted to 3T Troop, really enjoyed it. And I think, I know everybody says their time was the best time. But I think I hit a real sweet spot with the personalities that were there. Um, The guys who'd come through on course one and course two were now Lance Bombardiers, Bombardiers, uh, huge personalities, uh, vast experience, and very, very keen to to bring the young guys on. 
So I, I felt very fortunate to have such personalities there um, to sort of guide me through that that early period. So everything's going well, life in 3-2 troop. And then, as usual, um, something comes along to throw a curveball at you. I had a girlfriend back in the UK. She was putting pressure on me to get a UK posting. Up to that point, there was no sort of chance of, you know, the Gulf War wasn't even a blip on the horizon. At the time, the only Northern Ireland tours going were PGF, uh, Prison Guard Force tours at the Maze, which I volunteered and done one with 12 Air Defence. So I ended up getting, um, it was quite a short notice posting, back to the UK. And off I went to Topcliffe. Pretty much as soon as I arrived, I realized it was the worst thing I'd ever done. It just wasn't like being in the troop. And the authorities there pretty much didn't understand the mindset of the troop. So it really wasn't working out. And I was so disillusioned that I applied for uh, a local constabulary and um, had my papers for getting out. And just prior to me leaving the army was when we lost the two guys on March the 8th, 1989, in Londonderry, Stevie and Amo. So I went in to see the uh, chief clerk to try and halt the process. Too late, you're out, and that was it. So I already had my collar number for the the mainland force. So off I went, and um, I found that period very, very challenging. And after I'd got posted, um, Stevie went across into the patrol that I, I was in prior to me getting posted and in my mind I put him in that truck on that night and and I know what everybody will say well you could have sat somewhere else you might have uh, been on uh, on leave at the time or whatever but it's how it sits with you and it just didn't sit right. It's funny how you say this Andy because when we talked to Neil Hogg on pod 7 he more or less brought up the same thing so when they went out that night Neil sat where Steve sat but then decided, no, I'm not going to sit there and move. And he's felt guilty about that ever since. So it's strange how this affects two people in different ways. Exactly, you know. And as well as that, the day after Stevie died, I, I went down, as I was in the mainland, I went down and saw his parents um, and spent a lot of time with them and s- still have contact with the family today. As I was going through my probation in Durham, um, this is, was bothering me all the time, you know, and... And I was ringing uh, Jeff, Steve's dad up quite quite a bit and, and trying to explain to him, but trying not, if you know what I mean. Mm. So I was trying to get across how guilty I felt. And, and obviously it must have been quite messy. And fair play to Jeff uh, and for Sheila for sort of indulging that. And it, it bugged me so much that as soon as my two-year probation was up in my mainland force, um, I applied to transfer to the IUC not by any way of seeking any form of revenge or retribution, but by way of um, repaying a debt to the Cummins family, which I felt I owed, you know? Um, Now, the reason I'm not saying to Amos' family is because I I only briefly met Miles when he was coming through training. I did a very short stint while I was waiting for my posting uh, with the training uh, team. So that's the only reason I'm not sort of mentioning um, Miles in the, in the same light. When you did your maze tour, Andy, for the listeners that might not know, uh, the maze was a prison that held all IRA prisoners or the whole... Loyalists as well. Loyalists as well, held loyalists as well. But it's quite a boring tour. But when you were on that, you got up to Belfast and did an attachment with 4-5 Commando for a number of weeks. So probably safe to say that even in the 80s, you had a, a taste for what it was like operating on the ground back then yeah. as well. Yes, yeah, so when the r and R kicked in for for the unit up in West Belfast, which was where, where we went to Zulu Company. We were able, if you wanted to volunteer to go up, uh, I volunteered and went up and spent um, a few days, possibly a, a week, near enough a week up there. And it was absolutely exhilarating. They were so professional. They welcomed us. There was, there was no cap badge sort of angst or anything. The guys were were very, very professional, very welcoming and glad to have us there uh, and treated us almost as an equal. And and it was a different tour. So we were patrolling out of uh, North Howard Street Mill, which is still there today. Uh, we patrolled out in the old New Barnsley, out, uh, cutting through Springfield Road, around a lot of the areas which 
I didn't know at the time that I would be driving around single crewed in the car on my own. So Andy, what was the selection process like for the RUC? The selection process wa- wasn't any different to the mainland to get into the actual force, but then yeah. to get into E department was quite different. So um, as I said, I, I applied for this transfer and the process took around about a year and then there was a delay because I sort of fell between intakes. So I went across, did a, an initial selection day. So I f- got one of the rare flights across from the mainland uh, in the Belfast. It was uh, picked up by a plainclothes driver from their transport department. You know, rather than going around in armored convoys and armored vehicles, they would go around in soft skin vehicles with a nondescript driver. It just, you know, pretty much sometimes like what the military did. Sometimes that lack of having huge resources there allows you to slide below the radar. And they took me up to Antrim Road Section House where um, I was to spend the night before going for my um, sort of selection board the next day. Not wanting to sit and do nothing. And Antrim Road Section House at the time was also um, an operational station. So I went into the ops room, asked the duty inspector if I could go out with one of the patrols explained why I was here and he said yep we'll sort you out some body armor but you can't get out of the truck you gotta stay in the truck I was like yep fine by me and as I'm sort of getting the body armor and looking at uh, getting ready to go out there's these posters up on the wall saying that one of the gates was out of out of use because of the threat for an RPG attack and you're thinking geez this is all very very real here you know so in my tracksuit with a body armor on jumped into the back of the, the Land Rover and we went up we were basically around the Ardoin, Old Park area, Cliftonville, Antrim Road, with a three-man crew. So they had a driver and an observer. And basically, the observer deals with any any calls they get. And then they had a third guy who acted as sort of protection in the back. So he had a, an MP5. And it turned out he was a full-time reserve guy waiting to go into the training center. So it was very interesting chatting to him and how he was... And I think he ended up in possibly in my senior squad. That was that was very insightful, and I believe that was the reason I I got through the interview the next day. The interview itself was two superintendents, and one was you know, it's good cop bad cop. Oh, it's good you're a qualified constable already. You've got a driving course. It's really good. You've done some other courses. You'll be a great asset. And the other guy is well, you've got no family connection here. You don't know anybody here. Why are you coming here? Why should we give you a job? Are you coming here just for a, a short adventure and you're going to leave in a year or 18 months? And, and to be honest, my, my plan was to pay my uh, the debt that I, uh, as I saw it and probably do two years and leave, you know? When I finished the interview, it went that badly that um, the next thing was the medical. And I said to the doc, uh, there's no point giving me a medical. The interview was a disaster. And he said, well, I get £75 for every medical I do, so would you please do it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay. And then about two weeks later, I got the letter through saying I was accepted. Uh, at that point, I think my backside dropped out because it was like, this is happening, you know? But to that point, it was always, if you like, an aspiration. Yeah. It didn't seem real until that letter, and you're reading it in black and white. And then off I went in, in March 93. Uh, I pretty much arrived towards the end of the troubles although at the time none of us knew that that was it coming to you know that the troubles were coming to an end yeah because the ceasefire wasn't until 94 i think is that correct yeah the first one yeah 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 Yeah, then the Uh, second one was 95 march 93 went into the training center and because the law um, procedures are different in northern ireland i had to do the training center again uh, but the difference between that and the mainland is they want to get everybody through firearms training at the earliest opportunity. So the our squad was split into two syndicates, um, and I believe there was about 80 in our, in our squad. W- uh, one syndicate started firearms training the first week. Um, so Monday, they, they start their training on the Ruger revolver. The Friday, they, they classify and they take the weapon home. And then the following week, it flips. And we I was in the second syndicate. 
So by the end of week two, we were all armed. I believe it was week two, it could have been week three, but it was the very much the first thing we did in training. Well, the very first thing we did on the Sunday when you arrive is is your documentation and um, and a threat brief uh, by special branch and advice uh, regarding personal safety. What was the main motivation for people joining, Andy? The main motivation, and, and this is what impressed me um, by people, was they, there was a genuine and honest, if you like, desire to, to bring the troubles to an end and to serve the community. And, and people that I later served with who'd seen some of the darkest days and had maybe joined in the 80s said that the areas that they come from, you either went to the security forces or you went to the paramilitaries. Mm-hmm. And the line was just as clear as that. And, and some of these guys, you know, who'd, who'd seen, the, and girls, who'd seen the worst of it, the hunger strikes and, and those type of incidents and the, and the heavy bombing and the doorstep shootings, you know, said that they knew people who they'd gone to school with, who'd gone down the paramilitary line. And, and there's just a very much a sense of duty and a sense of wanting to to bring this to an end. Uh, and, and you found that there was legacy here. You know, there were brothers and sisters in it. There were fathers, there were uncles. Whole families were involved in the security forces. Um, and a lot, you found that the, the uh, a regular RUC officer would be the, the, the pinnacle of what, where they were going. So some would start off as part-time in the Royal Irish, some would start off as part-time in the RUC, or some would maybe start off as full-time reserve. Um, and just to, to explain the, the differences here, so in, in the UK mainland, you have special constables who volunteer to serve, and they maybe do one evening or four hours here, or maybe a Saturday or a Sunday. And they very much have the same in the RUC. It's called the part-time reserve except it's paid, and it's paid because obviously your life is at risk on duty, off duty. So they, they would come in and maybe you know check driving licenses. They maybe provide station security. Then you had the full-time reserve, and they worked the same shift patterns as a regular constable. Um, they got pretty much the same pay, although their duties were very limited. And the main role of the full-time reserve was station security because if you imagine if you send all your officers out working your your station your home base is is pretty much at risk so 24 hours a day stations had to be guarded um, as well as that so there was static uh, protection on key personalities houses high court judges politicians um, some magistrates uh, public prosecutors they all had static protection on their house which is a full-time reserve job. And then full-time reserve also were allowed to join the mobile support units. So they would do extra training, uh, driving courses, public order courses, and they would supplement the manpower in the, uh, in the mobile support units. So the, the force was, was very well organized. To function on a day-to-day basis, it, was, it incur, incurred vast amounts of overtime. You know, most people were hitting easily 80, 100 hours. And I was once told the figure of what it equated to in extra officers on the force of strength, and I believe, but don't hold me to it, it was something like an additional 2,000 officers on full-time establishment. So you mentioned training there, Andy, and one aspect of that training I've got to ask you is, do they teach you that RUC walk with the, um, the, th- oh, was it? the body armour? They actually uh, frown on it, and and uh, and, you, and it's one of the things that you're told not to do. But I think back in those those early days when body armor was so cumbersome and heavy, it was it was just where people went. In fact, every December they used to do a VC opera, a VCP operation, and the operational name was op- Osteopath because <laughs> seriously, people were on twelve hour shifts. That what they would do is they would take a small number of officers from each section. So you have four sections, um, A, B, C, and D in the station. and take a small group of officers and make a separate unit. And all they did for December was VCPs because um, there was usually a Christmas bombing campaign aimed at the the hearts of towns uh, and the city. And it 
part of the economic uh, campaign against the British government. And these people would do six six days a week, 12-hour shifts, uh, and obviously uh, stood out all day either stopping cars or providing protection, uh, hence the name uh, osteopath. It sounds to me that competition to be a full-time RUC officer was quite intense, and it also seems like a lot of people had to go that route, the reservist route. Would that be fair in saying that? I think people went that route because they were maybe dipping their toe in the water or maybe they had a relative in the Royal Irish. But but recruiting, there was never an issue with recruiting. They were all, it was always oversubscribed. And uh, it was while I was in the training centre that I heard about E-Department. I, I knew before I went over that the IUC had specialist units and and capabilities, but I, I had no idea to the extent uh, and what it was called. And uh, there was a couple of people who were coming from the full-time reserve in my squad, actually my class, who had ambitions to join E-Department. And I just kept hearing about E-Department. So I'm constantly questioning these guys who had maybe been on the periphery of operations, providing an outer cordon um, for arrests or, or operations. And, um, and it was clearly where I wanted to be. I decided that as soon as I got to the training center, I'd apply. Uh, and, but it didn't turn out as easy as that because at the time there was, although I was excluded probation because I was a qualified uh, officer already, for some reason um, at the time you had to have four years service before you could join E-Department. So I spent um, a very short time in uniform um, down in Lisbon. Um, although I, at the time B Division covered West Belfast so it covered um, Grosvenor Road, Springfield Road, New Barnsley, uh, Woodburn. But there was one station in B Division that wasn't in the West Belfast, and that was Lisbon. That's where they sent me. Which uh, I was like, although that there's obviously still a threat in Lisbon, it was very much closer to normal mainland policing than than I was actually looking for. You know, I wanted to get into. Uh, either B division or A division because during your training in the training center they take you out for a month and put you into a station and I was sent to Mount Pottinger um, which is in East Belfast but it's a station pretty much in a Catholic enclave uh, called the Short Strand to get to Mount Pottinger uh, the threat was so high you couldn't drive into the station so you had to go to the nearby station at Strandtown um, where you got into uh, two armoured Land Rovers, police Land Rovers, and you were escorted in by two military Land Rovers, front and rear with top cover up. You changed the, the route in, although obviously you're arriving at the same end location, but there were two or three routes in, um, and you only approached after the army had got out of the station and sealed the local area to get the convoy in. And that happened three times a day, seven days a week for oncoming, offgoing officers, civilian typists, civilian canteen staff every day of the year. Uh, and it was a great place. I really enjoyed it, the camaraderie in there in that month. So I was trying to get in there, but a lot of people want to stay around Belfast. And if you were sort of a single person, you could, a lot went up to London, Derry, or went, a lot went down towards uh, the border area. Um, so I was I was quite fortunate to get B Division, stay uh, in the Belfast area, but just unfortunate that I didn't get West Belfast. It was interesting, Andy, when you mentioned that when you went across the interview, you went to the office room and got uh, like a an acquaint out in the city. Uh, when I was out there, and it was 88, strange enough, we had the Australian police come across for a visit. No idea why, and I'll tell you what, I bet they regretted it. We are in De London Derry. We took them up to the PVCPs. Obviously, before we went there, we put them in the back of the vehicles, give them a briefing, said, don't worry about blah, 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 blah. Talks about IEDs, talks about RPGs. Two of the most frightened men in the world when we got to the other end <laughs> because they had no clue what was going on and all they knew was this could go badly wrong. So I've no idea why they come across to work with the IUC or do a, a fact-finding trip. Uh, because I don't believe in Australia they had many problems with RPG or IEDs. 
<laughs> anyway, we got them back, and we never seen them again. They disappeared into the RUC land, and I don't know where they drifted off to. But what an interesting trip they must have had. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, it's it's funny you say that, because as soon as they came out of this training center, I, I ended up in the close protection unit to just as a way of marking time till I could apply for a department. And I ended up this one day, my normal judge I looked after had a visiting law lord from London who was um, looking at the sort of the IUC and its special sort of uh, conditions it operated in. And we ended up taking him in a police Land Rover to Fort White Rock. And on the way up, as, as you sort of uh, drive up the White Rock Road, we got extensively bricked and bottled. And, and this lord is going, What's that knocking? That's a banging chaps, you know. <laughs> we sort of explain. He says, "Oh, good lord! I, I didn't realise it was quite like that, you know." Uh, Reality check. Yeah. As mentioned, the intro from deployment of the army in 1969 to 1976, the army had primacy for operations in Northern Ireland. However, in the mid 70s, the Bourne Report came out, and this is sometimes referred to as the Way Ahead Report and established the premise that the best way to tackle terrorism was through policing with the aim of increasing stability and restoring normality while making the REC more acceptable to the Catholic minority community. In other words, terrorism would be treated as a law and order problem with terrorists being treated as criminals. And around this period, the Labour government Harold Wilson established, sorry, abolished the special category status that IRA prisoners had previously been granted, allowing them, among other things, to wear their own clothes. This loss of political status would raise its head a few years later with the May's hunger strikes. But prior to the hunger strikes, a lot of the IRA prisoners went on the blanket, which was the phrase they used for not wearing any clothes and also the the dirty protests where they'd smear the walls of their cells with their own excrement. So this transition allowed the army to reduce deployed numbers while the RUC increased its numbers substantially over the following period. So Andy, you've touched on it a little bit already, but um, after training, what was like like on uniform policing operations, and how did it differ from the army? Having only been there, and I say it was a very short um, and very much a closeted tour I did with the military, being um, at, the, at the maze, and I, I, I'd only really had an insight into a proper tour on my my short stint up in West Belfast. But the the main differences are obviously. Um, for, for the guys who were over there at the time on four-month tours, they weren't allowed out, where a two-year resident uh, battalion w- would have uh, would have been allowed off camp. So in the police, obviously, you do your, your eight-hour shift, usually um, extended for overtime, probably a 12-hour shift, uh, potentially longer. But then you went home, but the threat didn't go home. The threat traveled with you. So um, you were under threat 24 hours a day. You're, you're always conscious of your home environment. Um, you're conscious of what you can tell your neighbors. Um, you know, you, you can't hang uniform out uh, to dry on the line at home. Uh, a big difference from mainland policing, everybody in mainland policing would have traveled to work in what we used to call mufti. So it would be police trousers, police shirt, uh, civvy jacket, and possibly take your epaulets off. Uh, and it was acceptable to travel to work like that. There's no way you could travel to work in Northern Ireland with bottle green trousers, light green shirt, and a jacket on. Uh, you just wouldn't have done it, you know, and nobody did it. Were you given areas recommended that you could stay in? I mean, we, we all know the Republican areas and the, and, the, and the Protestant areas, but were the sort of the likes of yourself coming over when you eventually rented or bought a house, were you given areas, sort of approved areas? You were you were sort of obviously you had the uh, the intelligence brief and then with it within your squad you know you're chatting to people and and it's it's no secret to you know to know that most officers around the Belfast area would have uh, lived in that sort of uh, North Down Ards Peninsula area um, so you were handy commutable to Belfast in fact even guys working in the border stations would have lived around that area as well because uh, they were going in three or four day stints because it was too unsafe to do a shift change on a daily basis. They had to be helicoptered in, helicoptered out. Other areas, you you would have steered to the sort of the neutral areas or more Protestant areas. So you'd have people, uh, officers living 
not necessarily in Porter Down, but in the surrounding areas of Porter Down, up the northwest, you're sort of looking Coleraine, Port Stewart, Port Rush, the places that were non contentious. And in those areas, like particularly in North Down, you were living in a mixed community. It, it, you know, there were Catholics and Protestants living side by side. How it happens in, in those areas, but not in the inner city areas, is one of the conundrums of the troubles, you know? A lot of those precautions that you describe, both Kevin and I recognise from our time as soldiers in Germany and soldiers who served in mainland UK would recognise them as well because those are sort of the standard things that you did back then, even as a, a soldier, not in, in a lesser or a high-threat environment that you were in. And I also remember being over there uh, on tour and you'd be one of the tasks if you went out on a patrol maybe in the countryside would be uh, you'd go and do a, a check in a farmhouse or a remote house. It might be the wife or the partner of an RUC man or a UDR man and it was just you know, doing a check to, to reassure them that the, you know, somebody was keeping an eye out for them. So Andy, what was the difference between Protestant and Catholic officers serving in the RUC? Uh, there's no difference whatsoever. Um Numerically, yes, there was. There was far fewer Catholic officers, um, not for the reasons that have been put out by some parts of the community. Uh, basically, um, Catholic officers uh, found it more difficult to visit their family, to still be a part of the community that they'd been brought up in and gone to school in, to return to those areas. Obviously, the threat is higher in those areas. They probably relocated due to to that threat so they're removed from that that in, that environment and that was one of the reasons why the very brave catholic officers that did take the step and join the iuc found it so difficult because um their relationships with their family their friends possibly became former friends became very very difficult and, that, and that's one of the the bonuses i had um, when you mentioned earlier about the difference between the army and the police I very much arrived, as I said, towards the end of the Troubles, but also not knowing anybody, not having gone to school there. All the friends that I made were within the security force community. Um, I hadn't grown up there and then decided on this path and then had to say, well, I can't mix with those people anymore because maybe they're connected to something or I can't mix with that set of friends because they may um, pass on information to security forces. So it was, in some ways, it was an advantage coming in, if you like, as a clean skin. It took the security forces from 1969 to the mid-70s to organise itself and optimise operations against terrorist organisations. The main thing that came out of this reorganisation and focus was uh, intelligence, which is the mainstay of any counter-terrorist operation. And the main difference between the RUC and the mainland policing is that the RUC had intelligence-led policing, whereas mainland UK police tended to have investigative-led policing. Talk about a book by a former special branch officer called William Matchett later. But in this book, he gives a great breakdown of intelligence sources. And he said that 60% was human intelligence, i.e. agents and informers. That He reckoned that what he calls a green book agent, i.e. a well-placed member of the IRA, saved around 37 lives a year. But these were a tiny portion of agents. It's estimated that use of agents over the course of the Troubles saved around about 16,500 lives. But their use has often been controversial, probably beyond the remit of this podcast to get into that. 20% of intelligence was obtained through technical means. 15% was uh, surveillance operations with the likes of E4 Alpha and the debt. And 5% was framework operations with the Green Army and through open source. I just want to quickly cover a little bit of framework ops because I think it's quite interesting when you compare it to what went on in Iraq later on down the line. Framework operations of the army, they were there to interdict and deter terrorist movements and obtain intelligence through contact with the civilian population. One of Pyra's aims was to separate people from the agents to the state, i.e. the police, the courts, and replace them with their own versions. And you saw this quite effectively done in areas like Free Dairy in the early 70s, which had to be broken up by Alp Motorman. An Alt Mortman took place in the early hours of July 1972, the 31st of July 72, and it was the aim of retaking no-go areas that had been established in Belfast and other urban centres. And it was the biggest British military operation since the Suez Crisis of 56, and the biggest in Ireland since the Irish War of Independence. So in the days before 
31st of July, about 4,000 extra troops were brought into Northern Ireland. Almost 22,000 soldiers were involved, including 27 infantry and two armoured battalions, aided by 5,000 soldiers from the local Ultra Defence Regiment. You look at those numbers, it often makes me wonder how we thought we were going to regain the likes of Basra uh, when we had a brigade in there for what was in Basra, Kev, a couple of thousand troops at the most. Probably out of push, yeah. yeah. And you think about, if you think about Belfast, or well, you think about Northern Ireland, and Andy, it's, it's only a couple of million people who live in the whole of Northern Ireland. Well, Basra, I was looking at the population stats, Basra is 1.4 million, and Derry yeah. and Belfast now, not back then, now yeah. is, is 450,000. Yeah. So I think we're bluffing ourselves with Iraq. I think as well, guys, and another point which is often lost on Iraq and Afghanistan is if you consider the border regions in Northern Ireland, um, Fermanagh, South Armagh, and mid Tyrone, the bulk of military transport was done by helicopter. That was lost when we went into Afghanistan and Iraq. And that so many IED deaths could have been prevented if we'd have had the helicopter support that was uh, available in Northern Ireland. But, you know, in William Matchett's book, he's quite interesting. He said that uh, he worked out in Iraq and Afghanistan once he left the RUC. And he was saying that the conditions should have been that the main concentration should have been setting up a police force and combating crime to establish a degree of normality. He thought they've, they had it slightly flipped around. I'm not yeah. sure the conditions would have allowed that or the the officers, police officers that you're recruiting over there with the, the intelligence, but it's an interesting premise. Afghanistan policing, it's part of the community, isn't it, rather than being an armed force which sits, sits outside. So think about um, there was a roadmap for policing for Afghanistan and on paper it should have worked, but there was no massive investment. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I totally agree with you, Colin, in that um, especially when you go back to uh, William Matchett's book when he gives um, a history of the Troubles and he mentions how many police stations were called barracks back in, in Ireland when it was even one country. And I think he mentions a figure like 1,400 barracks and there was one in every town and how officers lived in the barracks or lived in yeah. houses close by and were part of the community. It took eight or nine years before we got right together over in Northern Ireland. And even then, the Tasking Coordination Group, TCG, didn't form, I think it was until 1978. So all that intelligence, you had all those agencies, both in the RUC and in the Army, all holding intelligence a lot of the time. A lot of times they were being deployed on the same task but didn't know it. Um, so there's duplication of effort. And they were holding intelligence and not sharing it. And again, 9-11, part of the 9-11 inquiry was uh, all these agencies were all they had all the bets to tell them that these attacks were coming in for 9-11, but nobody was putting them together because nobody was talking. And I think it's probably fair to say that's what the TCG was set up to do and very successful. So, Yeah, the TCGs were um, unbelievable. So you, you had Belfast TCG and then you had a TCG North, TCG South. The problem that you had with the TCGs, and, and again, I think this is misunderstood by a lot of contemporary commentators now is the sheer volume of intelligence coming in, bearing in mind that most of it was time critical. This has to be sifted through. You have a limited amount of, if you like, uh, category one resources, military surveillance teams, police surveillance teams, uh, and armed support. You've got to sift through that information, decide which survival operation. Which You've got to your... sanitize it so it can't be traced back. Yeah, and then you've got to decide what operations you're going to run on those. Then you also have to decide, can we police the rest out with maybe with a VCP operation from Green Army or from Uniform Policing? Uh, and this is a daily, daily process. To give you an insight, later in my, my time when E-Department had become Special Operations Branch uh, C4, uh, C4A, I was doing... Um, surveillance tech advice for a command course, a gold command course, and we had officers on from the mainland. And their first one of the first exercises they get, they get a briefing, and they're told you have eight surveillance teams. One is sitting on a, a car bomb waiting to move. Another team sitting on um, a weapons move. Another one is uh, working on a kidnap connected to paramilitaries. Uh, one team is on training, another team is resting because they've been involved in a night operation. 
Um, and it goes on like this. And then he, it said, you've got three firearms teams. At the moment now, we have another two uh, potential IED threats come in, allocate your resources. And this guy from the mainland force, I think he was the superintendent, chief superintendent, he put his hand up and he said, uh, this is not for me. Because they're used to maybe getting one uh, kidnapping or maybe an armed robbery, they get a sniff of it. And they've got time to get all their resources together. And this might be their one big job of the year or their big job of the month. And this was a continuous rolling program of operations. Uh, and, you know, and hats off to the guy, you know, and they, they kept him on for the remainder of the course as an observer. But he just, he felt the, the pressure and the stress straight away. And he had the courage to say, not for me. I sort of go into the intelligence piece as a, a scene setter, but can you just break down so special branch of primacy for all terrorist operations? Can you just break down its main operational arms and how it operated? Yeah, so um, the, the main operational arms of special branch were E4A for the surveillance and HMSU for the firearm support. Could you just sort of define for me what HMSU did? Yeah, so um, HMSU would be the equivalent in the mainland of a specialist firearms officer. If you like, in policing terms, they're a tier one operator, uh, initially trained by Hereford, and then annually they would uh, they would go to Hereford and do um, drills in the killing house. Um, they specialised in the more dangerous operations, firearms operations. They provide QRF to surveillance, both um, army teams, police teams. If you had um, a VIP or principal, such as a high court judge who was under a specific threat, they would step in and and are under close protection. They also um, benefited from doing the long mower course with the RMP, uh, as well as the the police uh, CP close protection course. They uh, were sniper trained. So very, uh, very, very highly capable. Yeah, with the special branch having handlers that were looking after agents who were bringing in uh, human intelligence. As well as that, there was a technical department that were involved in providing technical support where required. Would that be cameras or tracking for various operations? We also air support. There was a dedicated air support unit, which uh, again would provide support to the operations. And all of this was overseen by the tasking coordination group. So if you can imagine, just to give you a sort of a trail of it, a handler would get a call from his agent or meet with the agent. They may pass some intelligence in. That would be fed in by a special branch into TCG. They would decide whether it was viable to put an operation in together. Then that would be put out to one of the military or police surveillance teams. They would deploy on that operation. and HMSU would provide the armed response, QRF, and arrest option. If the threat was such that it was deemed that it would be better to use the SAS regiment, then that would be considered as well. And it was a very considered progress as the operation went, and what was best for the task. And William Max's book, but in his day, he was saying that E Department was broken down into regional sections, and E4A E4A had six sections, a maximum of 126 people. HMSU had 21 sections, a maximum of 84 people. So going back to one of your earlier points, a lot of stuff coming in, but the actual resources of these units, they're only a small, they had a high failure rate. He quotes 95% failure rate for the courses. So there's not very many people and an awful lot of work to do. No, um, I, I can't recall a time when I was there that the teams were up to strength and the disposition would be, you would have an E4 team north, uh, E4 teams in Belfast, and an E4 team south. And in each of the same locations as um, the E4 team, there would be a HMSU team so that they could deploy together and, and be involved in joint operations. As for the pass rate, a quick insight into the process of getting in, there would be a pre-select day, which would involve the standard PT test, usually followed by a beasting session just to give you an insight into what the residential assessment would entail. So if you maybe just say pass the fitness test, well, this is what you've got coming. And that basic session would maybe be two to three hours. Lots of press-ups, sit-ups, continually running, shuttle sprints, piggyback, fireman's lift, 
wheelbarrows, all that. And that's your taster of what's to come. Map reading test and the shooting test on the day. Then if you were successful on that, you went into either an eight-day residential assessment for E4A or a 10-day for HMSU. Uh, both, again, very, very physical. And they would maybe run three or four assessments prior to each course with each assessment maybe having 20 to 25 candidates. On mine, I believe we finished with six and three of us were put forward for further training. On my course then, I think we started with just over 20. Uh, five of us finished. One uh, female who had been ex debt or 14 in and the other three guys had come across from HMSU. Find your military training that you did in the state behind OP world helped? Yeah, very much so on the urban and rural OP phase, which is part of the, the further training. But also the, the mindset of when we were in stay behind OPs where you're giving a task to do, but you don't just, uh, that's me done what it says on the paper. You're always looking, can I go that step further? Can I, can I deliver a little bit more on this? And that was very much the mindset within the department. It was about attention to detail um, on planning jobs or, or, or whatever you were looking at, whatever the task was. They were always looking for so much more. And the, when I got into the department, the senior operators that had been there from the early days, their local knowledge and their knowledge of um, the paramilitaries of both sides of the community was just impressive. And it wasn't meant to be intimidating, but it was very much intimidating of how much they knew. And you're just thinking, I'm never going to get that amount of knowledge and get to that level. And although, you know, our course, I, I believe, was 16 or 18 weeks, and then you've got a year's probation, and then it's probably another year before you're really feeling that you're contributing to, to the running of the team. And I, I found my, my first year uh, really, really difficult, and I sort of questioned, had I done the right thing? What, even though I got through the course, what, was I... Um, really up to the task and there's a couple of times I was very think very nearly thinking you know maybe um, I'm just really struggling on this and the uh, sort of the agnostic view of Protestant terrorist organizations and Catholic terrorist organizations was reflected in the unit's motto and emblem can you just cover that for the audience just so they understand sort of where your mental mindset was coming from yeah, so the, the emblem of E-Department was uh, an eagle in flight clutching a tourniquet, and that um, historically came from two of the first operations that the department did. So that I think I believe the first operation was Operation Eagle, um, or one of the early operations was Operation Eagle against loyalist paramilitaries, and the second operation was Operation Tourniquet, which was against uh, Republican paramilitaries. Um, so I don't know who devised it or came up with it, but it was then decided they would have this eagle and tourniquet. Matchett's book again, he talks about E4 success between 1980 to 98, where they had 1,500 arrests, 1,000 weapons recovered, 50 tonnes of explosives recovered, and eight terrorists killed, which brings us quite nicely on to shoot to kill. We'll have a quick discussion about this, but it's important to note that the majority of ops resulted in arrests I was just wondering, Andy, your view on what's often called the shoot-to-kill policy by Pyre and Sinn Féin. Well, um, Pyre and Sinn Féin always had a shoot-to-kill policy, and I, and I don't think they've they've ever denied it. I, they just said they were on operations. Uh, yeah, but you, they also, Andy, when, whenever they had their successful operation, their active service units were soldiers. Whenever they were shot dead on operations, they were victims. So Exactly. There's, exactly. there's, there's always a difference. Um, well, I, I was fortunate enough to work with um, a couple of guys that were involved in the, in the shoot to kill and the aftermath of it. And I don't know anybody who knowingly left the station on that day on an operation with it in their mind that they were going, going out to shoot somebody. They responded to what was in front of them in the situation uh, as, they, as they saw it and the threat as they could justify it according to the rules of engagement and and code of conduct um, and it's very easy today 
in in the light of today's Human Rights Act and today's standards to sort of judge actions which happened many years ago in a, in a hostile environment. And I think, and, and this is a real contentious one when you look at Stalker and you look at the Samson inquiries uh, and subsequent inquiries in, that have happened in Northern Ireland. I, I understand that you have to bring a mainland officer in because if you bring somebody from the RUC or PSNI to judge, they're going to say, well, it's, they're going to be biased from the start or they're going to be favorable. But the, the problem you have bringing a mainland officer across is they have no comprehension of the unique circumstances, especially going back to the probably the first one, Stalker, in the 80s, um, when officers were being followed home, shot dead on the doorstep, under car booby traps. You had, you know, school teachers quizzing children as to uh, what does mommy and daddy do so that they can pass on information to uh, Republican terrorists so that their parents can be targeted. You had managers in travel agents, um, anybody who didn't take um, travel insurance because the pyro were aware that the police paid into a, uh, an additional insurance fund. Um, one of the byproducts was you got free travel insurance. So on the off chance, certain um, travel agent staff may pass on information Hire about people who didn't take the um, insurance. So all of this is playing out, and then you're involved following known terrorists who you believe are on an active operation, and the next minute you have an incident. Yeah, I think it's important to point out as well that there's no all inquests into RUC shootings of terrorists. All of them have been declared lawful. There's two aspects to Pyra and Sinn Féin. There's the aspect of the bombings and the shootings and all the rest of it. And there's the other bit, primarily with Sinn Féin, with the manipulation of organisations to, to achieve a propaganda effect. The stalker report, so. like that, they, that all undermined how the army and the police could operate, well, primarily the police. But also, Sinn Féin was very good at getting Amnesty International in on the scene, talking about abuse of human rights. And I didn't find out until recently that Amnesty was active throughout the Troubles sort of poking around what the army and the IC was doing, but its first chairman was Sean McBride, who was also an IRA chief of staff 1936 to 1937. Small world. So you wonder why Amnesty... Mm, yeah, there you go. Oh, I, I think as well, Colin, um, one, one of the other things that the people re doesn't register with a lot of people is be it a soldier or be it a policeman, yes, they have specialist training, and, and if you go up to the the higher levels, be it um, an SAS soldier or a HMSU officer, all that specialist training, none of it trains you how to behave and what to do after you've uh, fired a fatal shot. At the end of the day, you peel back the uniform, you peel back the training. These are human beings, the same as the guy on the other side of, of the argument, and they have to go away and they have to sleep at night and live with with what they've done. And as you said earlier, I believe 70 officers uh, from the IUC have taken their lives over the period of the Troubles. But, you know, shoot to kill, you can easily discredit shoot to kill. And as we were sort of in the warm-up, we're talking about Sinn Féin focus on shoot to kill. It's been largely discredited. And uh, now the main thing they're talking about is collusion, especially on the agent handling side, which they're, they're quick to try and latch on. But there's a lot of emphasis on the perceived wrongdoing of the security forces, but Pyra, who, let's not forget, killed the majority of people during the Troubles, all seems to be a lot less focused on them. I totally agree. You know, there is a tendency, not just regarding the Troubles, but in a lot of, a lot of historical things now, to rewrite history, and particularly either to portray a government or the security forces uh, as, as the villains. And that seems to be a very common theme going forward. But, uh, but that's always been the case for any conflict. Yeah. The state or the the government and the, and the, the state forces or the you know the, the armed forces are always going to be held to a higher bar than a terrorist group. And the major but, difference... But it, and, and, and should be sometimes because we are more professional. And I think... The loyalist and the Republican 
Yeah, and, and the government never fought the propaganda war. It gave Sinn Féin a free hand to control a narrative, and now that that has come home to roost. And that, and that was the same with ISIS as well, because the government has to tell the truth. The terrorist groups don't have to tell the truth. They can tell them a different narrative. And if you look at ISIS, ISIS did exactly the same um, in Syria and Iraq. They could publish anything they wanted on the internet and through their means. And the coalition was more limited than what they could report on. Yeah. And it's... they were held to a higher standard. And I think we have to accept that. If you're in the government, you have to be held to a higher standard and you're. Your story, your story has rule of law. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're the difference, aren't you? We're upholding the rule of law and the fairness and the rights of everybody, including in war, prisoners of war, insurgents and terrorists. Yeah, and, and I mean, as you guys know, when, when you did your your tours in Northern Ireland, everybody, all the, all the soldiers um, know the terrorists. They know their backstory. Um, and likewise, um, in the department, if there had been a shoot-to-kill policy, bearing in mind we were deployed on these people day in, day out, then why were they not shot every day? Yeah. Why were they not shootings every day? And when you consider the amount of arrests, it, it speaks it speaks for itself. Well, I think you you mentioned it when we talked before about um, if you compare how many people were shot by IUC in comparison to the home for uh, homeland forces, the mainland, so Met and all the rest of it, the numbers aren't that Far greater. No, and I, and I think now there's a, a greater acceptance on the mainland yeah. when there is a, a police-involved shooting, yeah. especially if it's terror-related. There, there's, you know, if you like, public approval almost. Well, it's more accepting than it used to be because, I mean, the, in the last few years, we've had a number of incidents with um, uh, domestic terrorists, knives, guns, all the rest of it. And they've been dealt with with armed officers. There's not been a you and cry. There's not been an outrage at all. Actually, like you say, society now expects the police to deal with terrorists robustly. Yeah, and, and I think it overlooks the professionalism of the people who um, join the likes of E Department or or 14 Inter, as it was an SRR, as it is now, and the dedication to get through that training and deploy on on these quite dangerous operations at times to, to benefit the whole of the community. And they go, they go out there, take these people off the streets by virtue of gathering enough evidence and information to then um, have organizations arrest them. But you're always going to have people poking their nose in from outside. That's why you've try, always got to try and uphold the highest standards you can. I think it was um, at Loch Gull where, uh, I can't remember how many, IRA guys were killed at Loch Gull, half a dozen or so. But uh, the families took the uh, British government to court about that. And I think it was the European Court of Human Rights awarded the families £10,000 each. They said, they, I think the verdict was some long lines, they weren't unlawfully killed, but there were some gaps in the procedures that the army and the uh, the police and the security forces should have uh, foreseen. Uh, well, if you knew it was coming, you should have intercepted prior yeah. to and tried to do the rest. And and, 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 and their rules going to be held to a higher standard, and, and rightly so. We should be, because we are more professional. And like you say, over the years, everyone's got so much better trained. And within the department, we worked on loyalists and Republicans, and we didn't care who we worked on. We just wanted to be busy and actively involved because, you know, one side was as bad as the other. The only slight difference being that obviously if you were working against Republican terrorists, they were posing a, a bigger threat to members of the security forces. So you, you did feel that you were doing a lot more when you, when you got a success against them than you were against loyalists. To wrap up this part of the, the podcast discussion so far, I think what we've summary there then is obviously it took the mid-70s, all the departments were set up in the army and in the police, intelligence-led policing, Hugely successful. Matchett makes a convincing argument in his book that it was this intelligence-driven operations that forced the IRA to the negotiating table. And the IRA can dress it up any which way they want, but at the end of the day, they knew they weren't going to win, and that's one of the reasons 
they, they wanted the peace process. And one of the reasons now they're trying to paint that as not have a military defeat. Yeah, very much so. Totally agree. And it comes across in, in William Matchett's book how the IUC adopted a lot of um, military practices, especially within the department, finding the best training, getting the best equipment to get their people to the highest standards. And the best people, finding the best people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely so. I, I was watching the BBC documentary Once Upon a Time in Northern Ireland, and uh, like all these documentaries, I've watched loads, and there's, there's obviously going to be more out. What was your What was your thoughts on it? I just recently watched it, um, and I think somebody recommended it to me. I wasn't aware of it, and I thought parts of it were very good. You could see how how raw some of the memories were for, for the people. Um, I thought Gene McConville's son spoke very, very well. Patrick Kilty, I thought, spoke very, very well. And then there were other people that you could see were still very much entrenched in their views, and no amount of persuasion was going to going to change their mindset um and it was very to a degree still very tribal and i think that's quite quite sad when you consider how far down the the peace road we we've come i thought the provisional ira wife was exceptionally brave not only in what she described in that interview but her behavior during the hunger strike where, mm. where she was like turning away her husband was in prison he wasn't a hunger striker but, you know, the IRA are turning up to the door and she's telling them to do one from the doorstep. Obviously a very brave and, and forthright woman. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I thought she contrasted with some of the other females that were on it who uh, were very entrenched in their views. I, I thought as well that the the security forces weren't particularly well represented, even though there was, I thought... Um, I think she was a Greenfinch. Yeah, uh, that yeah, was on there, and and yeah. I thought you could see the toll that that had taken on, on her, her. Uh, and and her daughter. Yeah, because yeah. because everyone forgets the family. You walk out the door. The family live with the fact that for the next ten twelve hours, until you come back through the door. Yeah, I mean, terrible. I thought I the didn't... army came off particularly bad in this. I thought the RUC widow, whose husband was shot dead in the car park a couple of days after she gave birth, she was very eloquent. You had a soldier in episode one who came across quite well. But you had a soldier, and I think he was an ex-officer, who blinded a young lad. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. I, I yeah, didn't we... think he was particularly good. My God, he, thought... he came across terribly. He was like yeah. a cartoon yeah. villain. Yes, yes. There seemed to be well. no sorrow in him at all about the whole thing, and... Yeah, I, it, it didn't portray us very well because I don't, I don't believe that you know ninety nine out of a hundred soldiers would have regretted that forever because there's no way that we ever want to hurt a child. Yeah. No, I, I I totally agree, and and I mean having been a parent myself while I was in Northern Ireland and, and for a time a single parent. I mean initially I didn't tell my daughter what I did in case it let slip at school, and it's only it was much later down the path when I had to tell her when I was a single parent because of the, the weird times I was coming in and the way I was dressed. And, and that's something that, that she carries, you know, now as well. It's, and it's that family in the background, isn't it? You don't realise at all. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, just like one of the, my very close friends within, and he placed a lot of the, the worst time of the troubles. He, he's, he didn't see his firstborn for two days. She was two days old because he was placing the hunger strikes. And then, and again, it's it's the other side of the coin, which which people don't see the the person inside the uniform. I think the other thing that struck me in that documentary was there was quite a lot of focus on the hunger strikes. Yeah, and they mentioned a lot of the hunger strikers by name, and one of them was Francis Hughes, who at one point was the most wanted man in Northern Ireland. He killed a British soldier, was spe- suspecting the deaths of a number of others, and he was in a maze. He got um, he got at least a fourteen year sentence and a life sentence for, for what his crimes were. But that wasn't mentioned. You know, it was just mentioned no, the fact that he was no. a hunger striker. And contrast that to they showed the footage of Corporal Derek Wood and Corporal Howes. They were, they were just British soldiers. They weren't even mentioned by name. So they, they took time to personalise the provisional IRA guys, but those soldiers who were brutally murdered in an awful manner didn't even mention a name each. No, no. And, and just on the hunger strikers, I think, as well, um, they didn't deal with how those guys were used by their organization. You know, it was choreographed so that there would be a staggered death 
it wouldn't they wouldn't all die at the same time it would be this drip 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 to increase pressure you know very much those guys were manipulated and uh, and for what the rioting there were 67 security forces and public killed as a result of rioting and, and murders during and after the hunger strikes i, I yeah. think like i like all these things i think if you want to read about history you have to read more than one book I think with documentaries, you've got to watch all the various documentaries that are out there and there's some that give total different views. And they they talk to, obviously, different witnesses or different people that were involved and you get a more rounded feel for the whole 30 odd, 40 years that we knew it was as the Troubles. But obviously, it reaches back far longer than that. Yes, and, and whatever the security forces do wrong or when they make a mistake, it's always going to be you know, sensationalized, magnified, and the effect of it uh, will last for decades. Just to finish off this section, I genuinely believe there's very few armies and police forces could have conducted themselves the way that the RUC and the British Army, and let's not forget the RAF and the Royal Navy, because they all took part in Operation Banner as well. Mistakes were made of the obvious ones like Bloody Sunday, but at the end of the day, I hold my held up high for the service, as did a lot of the guys I served with. And, you know, I think, Andy, you were in the Army and the RUC. So I think you, you've seen it from both ends. Yeah, I can put my hand on my heart here and, and say I was humbled by the the quality of the people that I served with in the RUC who had seen the worst of the troubles and served many years before I did. Um, I was blown away by by their integrity and, and, and their quality and their professionalism. Okay, so as usual, we're going to finish off with Desert Island Dits, which is the guest choice of book, film and luxury item. So Andy, what have you picked? Book choice is a book by Colonel Mike Snook, How Can Man Die Better? The Secrets of Islandwana. Uh, everybody knows the story of Islandwana. This book, Mike Snook... Well, hold on, Andy, a lot of people won't. So oh, and, a couple, uh, and a couple <laughs> of sentences... <laughs> So um, it's the, the battle before Rourke's Drift. It was uh, portrayed in the movie Zulu Dawn, and Mike Snook delves into it in great detail, and he debunks a lot of the myths about lack of ammunition on the firing line, um, guys being made to queue for ammunition, and uh, he his research is meticulous. Over I think over eight years, battlefield visits, um, Zulu testimony, witness testimony, and he goes right up to the to the minute where he can prove everything. And then beyond that, then he gathers the evidence to recreate um, what he believes happens. And you're reading that recreation and you're thinking, do you know what? I think they're going to pull it off here. They, they're going to get back and form one large square or several squares in close proximity and hold out for the day. And then obviously it doesn't happen the the second horn comes around the, the crest of the mountain. But a, a fascinating book with uh, some great detail and some great hidden stories in it. A great Zulu victory, which the British somehow turn into a glorious defeat. <laughs> uh, as we're pretty we're, good at that. <laughs> yeah, we've had a bit of practice. And what's your film? Film is, um, because a lot of the ones that I would have picked, I don't want to duplicate. So uh, film choice is a movie called Before Winter Comes stars um, David Niven, John Hurt, and Topol. And it's set in Austria in at the end of the Second World War, 1945. And it's basically the demarcation line between um, British forces and Russian forces. It's about displaced people. Basically, uh, David Niven's the company commander, badly wounded during the war, but now got an administrative role. John Hurt, idealistic young second lieutenant, and Topol is a bit of a fixer, working between the Russians and the British, making a bit of money for himself, but making himself useful. But um, it, it covers a little known aspect of the end of the war turmoil in history, where we were repatriating uh, people to, to Russia um, who maybe had either surrendered deserted or fought for the opposition and whatever your fate uh whatever you had done you were considered a traitor and yeah we sent the uk sent back quite a lot of cossacks didn't they and the majority yeah. were either killed or sent off to siberia oh even um soviet prisoners the few that were liberated were then sent to the gulags for having not fought hard enough 
Yeah, amazing, isn't it? And your luxury item, and this doesn't surprise me, mate, knowing you, you know, I've seen your Instagram, so I know I know, why you, I know why you've picked this. Yeah, so I'm, I I would take my dog. I've had the same breed a couple of times now. One for their hunting ability, or this this one hasn't caught anything. But um, for their companionship, being in a surveillance role back in the day, uh, surveillance is a very, very lonely um, and isolated job. And I would have taken my dog quite a bit with me. Uh, for that companionship that that they give you, and those as we've all had those dark times when life's not quite going your way, the the dog seems to be the one that's your constant who who keeps your chin up and maybe stops you from doing something crazy or or something stupid, you know. So did you take him on recce's a few times? The um, previous one was uh, was on a few operations, you know. He was involved in the recovery of a handgun and some shotgun cartridges. Spent quite a bit of time in the border area and the footwell <laughs> and the footwell of the car. Did the REC get the Northern Ireland General Service Medal? Jeez. Yes. So um, there was a Northern Ireland Police Medal and uh, the ribbon on that was changed just after I received mine. And it, it was for two years uh, continuous service. And then they stopped giving them, oh, I think in the, maybe 2005, 2006, and then I got contacted um, about 18 months ago to say that they'd reintroduce them for service between, I think, 2008 and 2015. And I was entitled to a, another medal. So um, they popped it in the post. And um, I'm quite surprised to get another one. So, Kev, what's yours this week? So my book this week is First In. And this is the story of the start of the CIA's war in Afghanistan. So just days after 9-11, it covers the initial planning and deployment of CIA officers into uh, Afghanistan, operating by the Northern Alliance. And Gary Schroner, who's the, who's the author, was also the leader of this team. And he was coming to his retirement. He was 59 years old, which means basically there's still one war left in us, Colin. Not me, mate. Not there the is, is. There is. And... <laughs> Deployed into northern Afghanistan with his team prior to the US Green Beret teams even hitting the ground. And the book covers the complexity, the negotiations with Afghan warlords, the, the, the support they provided to the Northern Alliance, and obviously feeding all this back to Washington and the direction post 9 11 with the confusion around the world, not just um, with the Americans, about what's just happened and what should we do about it. Is this I the one really when uh, that's the one where Mike Spann gets killed? No, that's later. That's in the prison. Oh, uh, you got yeah, yeah. you got the two. Was he part of Team Alpha? Then was he, Kev? Because I've just read First Casualty, which goes into the Mike Spann. Uh, that, that was uh, that was a few years. I think it was a couple of years. It was later into the deployment. It was at the prison. It was. I saw the SBS two, right as well, wasn't it? Yeah, there was two CIA guys and American teams. And they were conducting interrogations and interviews with, with Taliban prisoners. Now, this is days after the initial um, towers went down and they were they rushed in and they started to set up because obviously the Northern Alliance were fighting the Taliban already at the time. There was the murder of uh, the guy called Massoud, the Lion of, of, of Afghanistan, who was driving the uh, Northern Alliance forward. They got put into, the, into that area. You've just sent me that, mate, so I'll look forward to reading that. My choice this week, it will be no surprise for everybody because I've mentioned it a number of times throughout the podcast, is Secret Victory, the intelligence war that beat the IRA by William Matchett. Uh, Dr. William Matchett is a security expert, author and academic, and he was in the RUC for a long time, 30 years, and a lot of it during the Troubles. And he spent a majority of that with Special Branch. Uh, he's got international credentials as well from training law enforcement organisations in Jakarta and Zagreb and on anti-corruption and to implementing programmes in Helwan and Baghdad on intelligence-led policing. Currently, he's a senior researcher at the Kennedy Institute for Conflict Prevention and his book offers an in-depth analysis of the British government's response to the IRA's campaign of violence and how intelligence gathering played a pivotal role in combating terrorism. He delves right into the intelligence apparatus, examine all the methods used by the security forces to infiltrate the IRA and gather information and disrupt its operations. He highlights the critical importance of human intelligence, emphasising the significance of individuals within the intelligence community 
who risk their lives to protect the public. Interestingly as well, another aspect that we touched on during the podcast, he has also experienced and studied the UK's inquiry culture. And Andy, you mentioned that a couple of minutes ago. And he warns against historical inquiries focused on recent conflicts. And he explains that these work against service personnel in a post-conflict context, especially where former terrorists become part of a government they have vowed to destroy. And this has been done by failing to frame the correct context, ignoring the weaknesses of memory and an affliction to hindsight bias. And I think we've talked a lot about that at various points during the pod. So it's a very interesting book and highly recommended. Yeah, totally agree, Colin. Um, I think there's one particular chapter in it where he just lists the amount of people killed by the IRA as being suspected informants. 80-odd you know, people, isn't there? Yeah, some as young as 15 with learning yeah. difficulties, and you've got to question some of the motives on, on that. And that's all just brushed under the table. It was actually you that put me onto that book, mate. So, thanks. Yeah, he's, he's, if you ever get the chance to have a conversation, he's a very interesting guy to, to chat to. That's it for another episode. So thanks to Andy for coming on the podcast, and to you, the listener, for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming, and our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us on all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you download us from iTunes, like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review there or anywhere you get your podcasts from. So thanks again to Nick Bewey for his continuing support to the series and offering technical support for his company, ISAR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm-hmm.